Welcome, everybody. This is where I missed the ding dong, where it tells us that everybody's welcome or coming in. Good afternoon, everybody. It's three o'clock, but we're just gonna wait one more minute to allow for any other participants to join us today. Okay, it's 3.01 by my clock, so we'll get going. Welcome everyone to the second of four in PLT Canada's Essential Skills for Job Seekers uh, webinar series. Today, we are really excited to present to you folks um, a way to set yourself up for success and how to maximize your job search. Uh, before we get started, we're gonna do a very quick poll. Um, this is really just to help us record data around who we have in attendance. Um, we have more than 220 people register today and I see that there's already 67 participants online. So if you can just go ahead, um, this is completely voluntary and it is completely anonymous. We'll have no idea who says what, but it will really help us. Hello, Guillermo, nice, nice to see you. We'll just give it another 10 seconds with the poll. Okay, well, thanks so much. Um, as I said, we have more than 220 people registered for this webinar. So all of you are on mute and you, obviously you can see that your camera is not on. This just helps with our recording and helps with the flow of the webinar. Um, there are ways for you to engage with us today, though. Uh, at any point, if you have a question that you would like response to, you can put that in the Q&A. You can also go into the Q&A and upvote other people's questions, and that will make sure that we get to those first in our, in our response. We did have 48 questions in our last webinar, so we were really excited to answer all of your questions, and we will give you uh, about 15 minutes at the end of this webinar to do the same. Uh, in addition, if you have more immediate concerns or needs, please put them in the chat and we will have staff checking that. Uh, if there's any way that we can help to uh, make this more accessible to you, uh, please put it there as well and we will do our best to accommodate. And during the Q&A, if you would like to ask your question live, at the bottom if you press the raise hand function, that will allow us to unmute you and you can go ahead and do that. Uh, this webinar is being recorded so that we are able to share the lessons learned today with a broader audience. The webinar will be launched on our website. In addition, uh, you will all receive a copy to your email. And so to get started, I'm going to pass it over to Maria with PLT Canada. Hi everyone, um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that PLT Canada's office is located within the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I would also like to acknowledge that we are joined by folks from across Canada that are each in their own territory of Indigenous Peoples of Canada. Uh, I encourage you to check the resource in the chat box that I'm about to put where you can learn more about local Indigenous territories and languages. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. And I didn't introduce myself. Um, I'm Tara Topping and I'm the Manager of Career Education with PLT Canada. Uh, we're really excited, as I said, to bring this to you today. PLT Canada is a non-for-profit initiative of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. We envision a world that values and benefits 
from sustainably managed forests and the great outdoors. SFI is an independent nonprofit organization that works in standards of forestry, conservation, education, and community to achieve a vision of a world that values and benefits from sustainably managed forests. Um, PLT Canada is committed to helping youth across the country grow into future forest leaders. As you can see, we have many different products and services that we use to, to help youth achieve that. Um, over the last couple of years, we have placed more than 2,500 youth in green jobs across 12 provinces and territories by supporting over 200 employers in the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and Canadian Parks Council networks. In addition to job placements, we offer a high quality mentorship program for youth and forest and conservation sector professionals. We actually have some of our mentees with us today and they are the reason that we are having this webinar series because it was something that they really asked for. And I'm really excited to announce that as of next week, we have registration opening on our website for our second cohort of mentorship. So if you are between the ages of 18 and 30, and you are looking to continue to develop um, some skills and some knowledge around building your green career pathway, I really encourage you to, to check that out on the website and consider registering. In addition to career programming, we also develop environmental education materials for parents and educators. We currently have some free resources available online and we're adding new resources all the time. We've just released a really exciting resource that we're really proud of, which is a guide to green jobs in Canada. And this features 12 Indigenous professionals from across the country sharing their voice and, and their perspective on green careers. Uh, and next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our guests for today. Um, with us, we have Sarah Casorso from Eco Canada. Uh, Sarah has her BA from the University of British Columbia her certificate in HR management from the University of Calgary. And she comes to us today with over 10 years experience working in human resources and recruiting for environmental organizations. In addition, we have Claudine Vidalo. She's the director of research at Eco Canada, and she is also a strategic planner, a business analyst and a program manager. So I'm really excited to pass things over to them as they enrich us with their knowledge uh, and wisdom on how to maximize your green job search. All right, thank you, Tara, for um, the introduction and thank you to Project Learning Tree uh, Canada for having us here today. We've been partnering um, with Project Learning Tree Canada to bring you a series of four webinars and it's these webinars are designed to help you develop the tools and the techniques that will help you in um, performing an effective job search. So today we're conducting the second of the series um, where we're looking at setting yourself up for success and maximizing and focusing your job search. Next month we'll be looking at the importance of making connections through networking and how to plan and approach your networking strategy. And then September, um, our final series, or the final webinar in the series, will be looking at how you can ace your interview. So um, looking at the skills and techniques that you need to help secure that job of your dreams. I know that searching for a job can feel like a full-time job in and of itself. Um, it really does require time and effort, but we've got some tips and some tools, um, hopefully that will help you make uh, yourself feel a little bit more in control and using your time more effectively. So the intended learning outcomes for today's webinar, we're going to um, hopefully have, you'll know more about the opportunities in the green jobs market, how to structure and plan your job search, how to create your online brand, and how to create a great uh, LinkedIn profile. And then we're also going to provide you with some resources at the end um, that can help you start writing and revising your um, resume. So we're going to do um, a quick poll here. So if you guys could just um, take a few seconds to look at these, um, we're just trying to get some information about what you think influences um, the, the time it takes to find a job.
All right, let's wrap up. And pretty much everybody is on the same um, track as I am with uh, all of the above are uh, play a role there. So it may take longer, um, you know, depending on the job market um, or if you aren't able to devote much time to your search. And so this webinar will provide you with information on the green job sector and some tips to maximize your efforts and make um, your job search a success. So now um, I'm going to hand this part of the presentation over to my colleague Claudine, who is going to talk to us about um, the work that her team in research is finding the trends and the opportunities in Canada's green job market. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so excited to provide an overview of green job opportunities both today and in the future, especially those that are associated with jobs in Canada. It is important to approach your job search or even career searching or decision making with an understanding of the green job market and what the trends are indicating. This knowledge will help you focus and tailor your job search towards the industries and green careers that you are passionate about. Um, I don't know if everybody is aware, but green jobs are everywhere in Canada. They exist in every industry, occupation, and region. So let's go to the next slide and start with reviewing the job market within the first half of what is turning out to be a very exciting 2020 or new decade. We all know to some extent the impacts the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the economy and jobs within Canada, but also globally. Although some were permanent, the majority of job impacts are believed to be temporary. Note that the impacts were not all negative. In fact, some businesses and jobs, such as those in high tech, public health and safety, and other essential services, including environmental services, saw a spike in demand during the first half of the year. But the overall impact or effect was that of a depressed job market in a very short time frame. One where about 5.5 million individuals in Canada either became unemployed or underemployed by April. A partial recovery in Canada's job market was seen in the last two months as more businesses reopened across Canada. Nearly 1.3 million jobs were in fact added in May and June. Many workers also returned to full-time work. So I guess the question is, what do you expect will happen in the next six months or the remainder of 2020? And when can we expect to see a full economic recovery? From a job outlook perspective, many economists believe recovery will likely be more gradual compared to previous cycles. In addition, recovery will be uneven by industry, by occupation, and by region. In fact, the latest Statistics Canada job numbers noted that employment was closer to pre-shutdown levels for industries with businesses and workplace settings that can apply physical distancing, such as those in the consulting services area, where a lot of environmental jobs are, by the way. Over 150 employers, representing over 40,000 workers, participated in our very own HR Pulse survey from April to June. And what we've seen for June results are, of, um, are noteworthy. Employers are now focused on re-energizing their business activity and staffing levels as provinces and territories continue to reopen in phases, but they are still navigating through a, lot, a great deal of economic uncertainty and also a temporary shift in green mandates. I don't know if some of you have heard some of the temporary suspension of um, environmental protection activities across Canada but that has, some of them have resumed. Our organization also monitors green jobs that are advertised online. Using a job posting scraping system or algorithm, we found that most of the green jobs are posted today by environmental consulting firms and governments. Environmental technicians, lab technicians, and restoration managers make up the top three jobs posted currently in Canada for environmental or green jobs. In general, 
employers are also looking for workers from very, with various experience levels. Many of the current environmental jobs advertised require at least a bachelor's degree. And then also a number of personal and interpersonal skills have been cited as required or preferred within the job postings. Um, the top three that I saw was communications, dedication, and collaboration. Let's go to the next slide, please, Hannah. Oh, that's, stay with that one. Our organization also generates environmental labor market forecasts for Canada by region and by occupation. I'm pleased to share with you some of our preliminary analysis or results that we're able to share and they're gonna be included in our updated 10 year forecast to be published in August. A few insights. Number one, the proportion of workers considered to be part of the green economy or what we refer to as the enviro share has been increasing over time. In 2014, we found that one in every 50 Canadian workers were in a green role. In 2019, that proportion has increased and it's now nearly one in every 30 workers. As a percentage, that equates to 3.3% of all workers in Canada are in a green role. Second highlight is while green workers are employed across Canada, close to 90% are working in Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, and BC. Not surprising numbers, but what was more interesting to highlight was that even if the territories or green jobs in the territories were the smallest amongst the provinces and territories, the region actually benefits from the highest enviro share at 6.4%. Third finding is that green workers come from a wide variety of backgrounds and educational programs. And the fourth finding was in fact, among the 500 different national occupation classifications that exist in Canada, nearly 90% or 458 occupations involve a green worker. And among the 458 occupations we've identified, green workers within 60 occupational classifications require green specific knowledge, skills, or training. So this is more like a discipline plus concept. You could be an engineer, but you also have to have environmental knowledge and skills or training to be an environmental engineer. And so that's what we would typically call a core green worker. The last finding that, we've, um, that we have from a broader perspective, the, the macroeconomic picture of environmental jobs, is that when we calculated net hiring requirements, that's basically the sum of expansion demand or jobs created due to growth, as well as retirement-driven replacement demand, meaning jobs that will be opened up as a result of needing to replace retiring workers. The net hiring requirements for the environmental workforce over the next 10 years is staggering. It's 233,500 jobs, or nearly 38% of current environmental employment levels. That's very interesting. Most of the green jobs that will be created will be due to needing to replace retiring workers, meaning there's a factor of needing to um, manage through the loss of productivity and knowledge in the industry over the next 10 years, and we need to mitigate that sooner than later. I also wanted to note that the number that I just shared with you does not include job postings resulting from other types of turnover, for example, just other types of attrition. But know that these job openings will also pop up during the forecast period. For my last slide, we then decided to analyze, just for this presentation, we analyzed green labor demand within occupations specific to forestry. And we noticed that number one, forestry professionals actually have the highest concentration of green jobs across all occupations in Canada. They have the highest enviro share, which is very interesting. Secondly, and this is in alignment with the overall finding that job opportunities will be driven by replacement demand. The same is true for forestry specific roles, which you will see in the um, table below that um, bullet point. In fact, over 40% of forest products processing supervisors 
are expected to retire in the next decade, and that will create significant demand for that occupation. So back to the table, what this table does is summarize the key data points for each of the forestry specific occupations that we have gathered for green LMI. If this table doesn't represent all jobs for those occupations, but just those jobs that pertain to a green role. You will see that um, the first column will just list down the percentage of the enviro share by the NOC occupations that you see there. Second column is those, um, and those occupations and the green employment within those occupations in 2019. Third is just the net hiring requirements to 2029. And finally, the expression of that net hiring requirement as a percentage of 2019 green employment. I should also mention that within forest and conservation, and this is looking more closely at current job postings, the top online job postings of late are um, mentioned before restoration managers. Over 400 unique postings are available today. The second one is forest technicians. Third is forest technology. And then um, there's also forestry development specialists and fire prevention technicians that come up at the top of the list. But I do want to note that not all of these occupations are, are the, the occupations or opportunities um, that are pertaining to green jobs within the forestry are more than the occupations I've just cited. In fact, there's many more occupations that are, for example, in HR accounting roles that would also be considered a green job. We simply highlighted those that are fully attributed to the sector. So with that, um, I'll leave you and turn over the presentation to Sarah. And I do thank you for listening to the LMI portion of the presentation. I invite you to view our free research reports on our website, eco.ca, and to subscribe to our e-newsletter or follow us on social media to be alerted of upcoming publications like our upcoming Outlook. Thank you. And over to you, Sarah, for the next slide. Great. Thanks, Claudine. Um, so now that we've heard a little bit more about the types of job opportunities out there, I thought we could do another quick poll uh, to find out how many people are on right now that know the kind of career that they're looking for. So this poll is just asking if you um, know the types of positions and the employers that you're interested in applying to. So we'll, we'll launch the poll and, and have about 20 seconds um, to quickly answer. All right, somewhat. So most of you guys are answering um, that you know the type of position, um, but not sure which employers are a best fit. So um, we're going to talk throughout about the importance of targeting uh, your job search, which also would include, you know, finding out and researching the, um, the employers that are hiring for those types of roles. Searching for a job is hard work, so an effective job search can look a lot like a full-time job, as I mentioned before. And so throughout the course of the search, it's going to um, have some ups and some downs. You're going to face uh, rejection, frustration, and it can be a challenge to stay motivated, especially at times right now when we've got a, a pandemic to complicate things even more for job seekers. Um, but I'm here to tell you to not give up and to persevere. Um, and so I'm going to share today some tips um, to make sure that your job search stays on track. So my first tip is to make a plan, a job search plan, and to do this for yourself um, every day and to not just start your job search haphazardly. Um, always planning out your day is really going to help you focus and figure out the best um, way to tackle the daunting task in front of you. So this can be a technique that you use both if you're searching for a full-time job or if you're trying to fit a job search around you know, other um, activities that you're doing. You're gonna look at your daily schedule and find windows of time um, for the different elements of a job search and then divide your time into, or you divide your day into blocks of time. You have to be creative sometimes when you're busy, but there's always an opportunity to find an hour or so to work on your job search, um, you know, either before breakfast, after your dinner or on the weekend. 
if you seemingly have um, an endless supply of time ahead of you because you're unemployed, a job search plan might be even more important to help you um, stay focused and structure your day so that you don't fall into um, you know, the, the hole of procrastination and, and Netflix and, and that kind of thing. So this slide is just showing an example of a daily routine for a job seeker. Um, it just gives you an idea what your day could look like and provides a starting point and a structure for you. So um, you can see here that I put in some time for networking. So, um, you know, following up with network contacts that you've met, um, you know, online obviously as well, how we're doing this now over the phone, uh, research, so researching the companies out there that you, um, are, you know, you've said now that you don't necessarily know which employers uh, you would fit with. So here's your opportunity to, to do that research. Um, and, you know, setting aside the time to apply and draft your materials and, and all of that thing. Um, updating your LinkedIn profile, so your social networking, um, expanding your network, following up with anybody that you've reached out to for applications or interviews, and then also, you know, prepping for the interviews that you're getting invited for. Um, you know, doing skill improvement and competency-based interview questions. Those are all available online, so you can kind of prep that way with um, just a general theme of what most interviews are going to cover. And then, of course, you want to have some personal time. That's also very important. So eating right, exercise, and social connection matter. This is uh, just an example of how a plan could work. So it's not saying that you have to be uh, doing all of these things in this order that I'm kind of saying, but it's just emphasizing that a daily routine is key for productivity, uh, no matter what your circumstances are. So hopefully uh, you can take some of these principles and you know, adjust and make it work for you. My second tip to maximize your job search is to know what you want um, and to do your research. So this is important in helping you target those jobs that you really want and making the most of the time that you do have. So when you're starting your search for a job, you should spend some time figuring out um, things like the kind of job you want. So uh, a full-time, part-time, freelance, remote, you know, a combination of these things. You also need to think about the kind of company that you want to work for. So uh, is it a nonprofit, an agency, a firm in a specific industry, small, large? You need to, to consider those things. And then also look into um, or ask yourself if you want the traditional nine to five sort of schedule or do you want um, you know, a shift type work, um, field work. Often field work is going to have shifts and um, more condensed hours with longer breaks in between those days. So figuring out all of these things out before you start your job search is really going to help you be more effective and targeted. And then you're going to know what you want um, and where to start looking for those things. So research can play a big part in helping you find out what it is you want from a career. Researching potential employers is vital to an effective job search. Um, it comes in handy at three pivotal points during a job search. So first, when you're deciding what company uh, or employer you'd like to work for, then when you're ready to apply for the position, and finally, when you're interviewing um, and you know, testing your knowledge. So there are many tools you can use to help with this research, um, including looking at the company website to find out more about the leadership and the organizational values. You can look for recent news stories and articles um, about the different companies out there. You can see if anyone in your network works for the company or um, could provide some insight, perhaps an introduction. And then you can also use websites like Indeed or Glassdoor to find out what others are saying about the company. Um, I would just caution using those peer-generated reviews like Glassdoor because oftentimes, uh, as you find with any other uh, avenue for review. Sometimes people spend more time on the negative, so it's best to, you know, really do your research and um, try to compare all sides of uh, the conversations that are going on about a company. So you can see from this example on the slide, um, someone interested in the role as a forestry research biologist should be doing all the things I just discussed to find out more if they're a good fit for the company and how they should tailor their application. So my third tip is to stay focused and avoid distractions. So uh, procrastination is something that we're all guilty of at one time or another, and it's definitely easy to get 
overwhelmed with a task like a job search um, and you know put it off till tomorrow but then tomorrow turns into another day and so on and, and so on so um, distraction and procrastination can definitely slow down your search because you're missing deadlines and opportunities or perhaps you're rushing an application and so you you're making mistakes um, so one of the keys to an effective job search is to minimize distractions to help you stay focused and again putting in this uh, a schedule for your day or your week will really help you um, hopefully stay focused and it can allow for those times to catch up on Netflix or whatever it is that uh, you know can sometimes distract you so things like um, the computer Netflix housework even um, can definitely be a, a welcome escape from the daunting task of looking for a job so whatever the cause is you'll most likely find yourself justifying the delay just look for ways to break these patterns um, of behaviors and stay focused on a goal, which is obviously finding the job that you um, love going to every day. So frequent um, distractions can definitely wreak havoc on your productivity. So the first thing you can do is get go back to my first tip, plan your day, find a calm, productive place to work. So, um, you know, sometimes you might even have to go to a library or a coffee shop. Obviously, social distancing applies right now, but places where you don't have the disruption. So maybe um, doing this at home isn't the best place for you. You're also going to want to keep off social media. Um, so things like Facebook and Twitter, all those things, you should just try to turn off those notifications, um, block the online distractions. There's uh, apps out there that can actually um, do that for you. So I believe they're called antisocial or there's one called concentrate. So these will actually block you from uh, certain sites for an allotted period of time. And then always remember to take breaks. So again, I'm really harping on that um, plan your day, but it is really important to keep yourself focused and structured. My fourth tip is um, making sure that you have all your job search materials and resources organized and ready to go. So it's important to personalize and customize your application materials for each job that you apply to. Um, to make this a little bit easier, what I recommend is having a core cover letter and resume. So um, then from there, you can be ready to tailor it for each new job application. And this means that you're not starting from scratch each time. And you can even have multiple versions of uh, your resume so that you can apply to more uh, like more positions or different sectors and, and that kind of thing. You're going to want to make sure that you store these in organized folders. So either on your computer or um, like a platform like Google Drive or Dropbox and make sure you're using clear naming conventions so you, that you don't mix anything up. This again makes it so much easier if you ever need to refer to something in, in the future. In our last webinar that we did, we did talk about how to create a resume and a cover letter. So you can visit the PLT Canada um, website. And I think I saw some of it going on in the chat there um, to, to get back to the recording of it, because that webinar has a lot of tips for creating resumes and, and cover letters to get yourself noticed. My fifth tip is to keep a record of all the applications and inquiries that you are making. It might seem like a waste of time or, um, you know, a little bit labor intensive, but keeping track of which jobs you've applied to or even considered applying to will help you out in the long run. So, you know, we've got this example here of a spreadsheet, um, but even like a simple list to keep handy on your computer or wherever, um, just again helps you from applying twice or um, reading the same description over and over again. And then you'll also have some sort of a record that you can use either as a, a metric to determine your level of success uh, with the different types of jobs or companies, or, and this has happened to me as a recruiter when I've called somebody, um, sometimes you've been applying for so many jobs, you can't actually remember which one you're, you're talking to. And so it's important to have a, uh, a, somewhere that you can easily access and reference when they call you or and if you're not prepared if you're not at your desk or wherever it is that that list is just say you'll call them back it's totally fine to um, you know say you're not in the right position or you're not in the right place right now and you call them back um, so this screen is just an example of what you could use and and we'll provide this template after the webinar so in this example there's a high level summary tab where you can 
store information about each application, the title, the date, um, the response from the employer. It also has additional tabs where you can store more detailed information about each application. So including uh, you know, the documents that you submitted and any communications that you've received from the recruiter. Whatever format you decide to use, um, being organized and keeping track of your applications is definitely gonna pay off in the long run. So um, tip number six is networking. And we are gonna talk more about networking in um, greater detail at our next webinar. But I wanted to mention it here because it really is important. The hidden job market is a term sometimes used to describe jobs that aren't posted online or in um, job ads. So I wanted to do a quick activity now. Um, so just use the chat box to tell me about, you know, what percentage of job um, fall into this hidden job market. So basically what, what percentage of jobs are not advertised? And we'll give about 30 seconds for, for this. Just take a guess. All right, yeah, there's. All right, so I think I saw as low as five and as high as 90 in the chat box there, um, just in the quick glance that I took, but um, published estimates of the size of this enormous um, cache of jobs has ranged from 75 to 95% of total uh, job market. So it goes without saying that networking is incredibly important during a job search to help you access these um, hidden jobs. The right employee referral can increase your chances tenfold of landing the job. And if you're looking to make a career change, um, your professional network can support you by helping you find connections in the industry that you're trying to break into or helping you find leads for jobs uh, at specific companies. So taking the time to be to build meaningful relationships with those in your professional circle is really important because the, the time might come when you're looking for work, um, you'll be able to tap into those valuable connections for referrals or maybe insights into different job leads and other valuable information. So if you're interested in more uh, tips for effective networking strategies to help you land a green job, you can register for uh, the next webinar that's coming up on August 27th and details are on the PLT website. So when you think about the term branding, you may think of a particular company or a product and these are brands in the traditional sense, um, but also as a job seeker, it's important to brand yourself. Your personal brand breaks down as marketing yourself, so your experience and your expertise to potential employers. Having a cohesive personal brand can help you stand out from the crowd and appeal to hiring managers. In this day and age, you should expect that when you apply for a job, if you're gonna be in consideration for an interview, then the hiring manager is probably gonna be looking on uh, Google to see what you're up to. So you need to make sure that you are ahead of that game by making sure that when they type in your name, uh, the information that they find is flattering and professional. And if you know they're likely to see you playing uh, beer pong or some political post, uh, you might have some work to do on that front. A professional and consistent personal brand helps you tell your own story, um, explain your core values and other details about skills and passions that may not come up in traditional job search format. So another poll for everybody is, are you currently using your online presence to market yourself to employers? So we'll give you um, about 20 seconds again to answer this. All right, what do we have here? The majority is somewhat. I have a social media profile with clear contact information, um, and then another 30% are saying, yeah, um, they're updated and reflect my personal brand. So that's, that's really good. Um, it's, it's really important that you 
uh, use these tools that are free to really market yourself. And so if you're not quite there yet, um, how do you start building your brand or how do you um, expand on what you've got? The first step is to, term, to determine what your brand represents. So you want to ask yourself a few uh, questions. So what motivates you to get up in the morning and tackle your day? What makes you unique? What are you passionate about? What are your key skills and accomplishments? When you begin to answer these questions, your personal brand really starts to take shape. So your next step would be to build a strong social media profile that catches the attention of recruiters or hiring managers. This slide shows some of the key social media sites and tools that you can use um, and that recruiters are looking at. And you can use a combination of these uh, to, pro to promote your brand. And some tips to increase your visibility would be to make sure that you are frequently updating your profile um, to make sure that your information is up to date. You're gonna also wanna use the same profile picture and color schemes across all networks so that it's easy to identify that, you know, this is the person on Facebook as it is on LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that your information, your bio information is listed the same on all sites. So depending on the format of the program, you may need to tweak slightly, but try to be consistent. And then be active. So post relevant articles um, through sites like LinkedIn to show that you're up to date uh, with the latest news and trends in the green job sector. So now I want to focus on uh, one specific social media platform, which is LinkedIn. LinkedIn um, is obviously uh, intended for the professional side of our brand and our lives. So your profile on here really builds a strong online reputation and the more complete and accurate your profile is, the more chances you'll have to be found um, and contacted for a job. Recruiters do use LinkedIn to post jobs and also search for candidates. And so I want to look at some of the key sections of your LinkedIn profile and how you can make sure that they're really showing off um, your best attributes. So some of the um, sections on LinkedIn that you can use to your advantage is the public URL. So you can actually edit your LinkedIn URL, URL um, within your like the editing piece of your, when you click on your profile and it says to edit, you can actually do that. So you can change it to like for me, for instance, I changed it to Sarah Casorso. So it just means that it's like, you can put it on your resume, your link to your profile and it's super clean and easy and doesn't have, you know, a bunch of random letters and numbers that just kind of look all jarbled up. Um, another one is your banner image. So you can really create a nice eye-catching banner image to help your profile stand out and just really make you look like a polished professional. For your picture, you're gonna wanna have a headshot that obviously includes your head, neck, and a bit of your shoulders, and you know, use this for a smile and, and something professional. So this, um, this isn't where you're um, you know, at Disneyland or something like that, where um, it's just not, that's not the right picture for this particular platform. Then there's the headline. So you're gonna want to differentiate yourself by using keywords related to your skill set and keeping um, you know, that positive. And then your summary is where you would add a little bit more about yourself. So um, you know, who you are, are you an undergrad, a graduate, an EPT, that kind of thing. Uh, what you offer, so your skills, your experience, your personal information, so some of your interests um, and your hobbies or perhaps areas where you're volunteering. And then your call to action. So you might say something like May uh, 2014 graduate looking for a full time position starting in the fall, something along those lines. And then the experience um, is a really important section. This is where you should list your work experience and achievements. And it's very similar to what you would do on a resume. So your chronological um, is the newest first and LinkedIn automatically does this for you. And then like the resume format, it would include the company name, the job title, and the key responsibilities. And try to start with action verbs and quantify achievements um, if possible. And keep, uh, keep it short and concise. So you can see from this example that for the first work experience listed, they haven't listed any achievements or responsibilities. So this is a big missed opportunity. Um, if you're able to provide more detail, you're allowing the recruiter to get a, a more true picture of your accomplishments. 
And then your education. So you want to add all your past education. Um, it might not always be relevant to all or the particular employers or jobs that you're seeking out, but it definitely helps grow your uh, network through different alumni groups. And then again, like I mentioned, your volunteer experience um, is a great way to showcase your skills and experience, um, particularly if you don't have maybe some formal work experience. So keep it professional and relevant to the sector that you're um, applying in. And then the last two sections I want to talk about are recommendations and skills. So the recommendations is uh, you can actually ask your connections to provide a recommendation for you. And this is just a great way to uh, show a recruiter that you're valued and respected by your peers. And you can, um, through your LinkedIn profile, you can send a request to connections asking them for this. And in return, you can do it for them. And then you can also um, add skills. So this is your opportunity to showcase your key skills um, to make sure that they align with the type of key, skill, key skills required for the jobs that you're looking um, to be hired for. And then people can actually go in and endorse those skills for you. So we're gonna have time um, for questions in just a second. I am cognizant of the time here, um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the resources that we've talked about today and the resources that we're gonna share with you after this webinar. So we'll share the job lead log, um, a market yourself checklist, and then um, an improving your LinkedIn profile checklist. And I just wanted to jump in with one additional resource that PLT Canada will add to our, our mail out after this webinar. So Sarah talked about networking yourself and one really awesome opportunity that you have to network yourself is by using a tool that PLT Canada can offer and that is wage matching. So if you are seeking, for, uh, seeking a green job and you are considered a youth, so under 30, you are eligible to potentially get us to match 50% of your wages up to approximately $5,200 um, for a, a work experience that ranges from uh, six to 24 weeks. And this is a really good opportunity to help tap that hidden market that Sarah talked about. So we are going to send out a letter that you could actually present to employers to say, I would like to work for you. And if you hire me, I can actually have half of my wages paid. Um, and so that's a really powerful tool. We are going to talk about it a little bit more next um, webinar when we do uh, networking. However, I just wanted to post this right now. Awesome. So now okay. I think... Yeah. Oh, sorry, Terry, you go right ahead. before we launch into questions because I was uh, I just made some edits to that original demographic poll and I promised we'd have a chance to do that again. So we're just going to launch that demographic poll and this time you will have a chance to click all that apply, not just one. And we'll just leave that up for about 30 seconds. Thanks everyone so much for participating in that. That's really helpful because we can able to tailor some of our products uh, and make sure that we're reaching to the network that um, have the actual people that are there. Um, so now we're gonna go to question and answer. Um, I see 11 questions in the question and answer box. Feel free to continue to post. Um, and as I said earlier, if you see any question here that is particularly of value to you, please feel free to upvote it using the, the little fingers up or the, the thumbs up sign. But just for the first question, Sarah, how likely are employers to hire an intern with a wage subsidy when they don't have any openings? Um, I don't know if I can comment exactly how likely, but um, for instance, there's a lot of opportunities out there that um, maybe companies, smaller companies, aren't posting for because they don't think they can um, afford it at the time and so they may not know about the wage subsidy programs either and so if you bring that to their attention uh, that might be your way in because maybe they don't even know about it so there isn't a posting to put up because they they don't know that it's an option for them so um, if you go in there saying that you're pre-approved for this um, you know they they probably are more likely to um, consider it I guess. Great. 
Um, is having a LinkedIn profile necessary? I am not comfortable when people can just look me up online and compare my profile with other applicants. Um, from my perspective, and this is a personal opinion, I think they are necessary. And when we can't find you online as a recruiter, I, I, that might be one reason why I wouldn't reach out if I could see everybody else and get a little bit more background information. The great thing about LinkedIn is that you can control what you put on there. Um, so you can put on, you know, the information that you are comfortable with. And also it's a really great networking tool. And so um, I think that in this day and age, it's probably something that you would benefit from. Um, but, you know, take the privacy um, considerations as well and, and maybe just um, consider how much you share or choose to um, engage on that platform. But I definitely think it is an important tool. Great. Um, a degree versus an advanced diploma, post-secondary school, et cetera. Can a person be over-experienced or under-experienced for a job? I think sometimes uh, recruiters, we can have bias um, it's natural and so sometimes when you're hiring a junior position and somebody is applying with um, like a master's degree and the position doesn't necessarily require that you can get ruled out and so I have known some applicants to not even list that on their resume or on their application for that particular job so if the job's not asking for it you can sometimes, as long as you meet what they're asking for, there's stuff that you can withhold and you're not going to be penalized for that. Um, in terms of being underqualified, usually um, on a job posting under the qualifications, the recruiter is going to put on there that uh, this is the degree that they want or the school that they want um, or something similar, or they'll say something like combination of work experience and education combined. So just really pay attention to what they're asking for because they're giving you the information that you need there. And Sarah, would you ever tell someone not to apply if they didn't meet those minimum qualifications? Um, I think that if you can demonstrate um, why you meet them, and if you're off by like a couple years or you're off by a particular program, for sure, explain it to the to the recruiter. Write it out in that cover letter and say exactly, um, acknowledge what they have asked for and maybe why you don't have exactly that, but uh, demonstrate why what you do have is, you know, going to make you successful in that role. So I think that's the important part, and that's sort of like a lot what we talked about in the last webinar was just really making sure that you're um, providing some clarity and some transparency for why you're applying for these roles. And so obviously if the role's requiring a PhD and you just have your undergrad, that's, you know, I would say you probably aren't going to um, be considered for that role. But if you match some like closely, um, you know, if something says they want seven years and you only have five, I'd say apply. You never know, because you don't know who else is applying out there. Great, you're answering multiple questions at once. Um, this person is stating that they, they started learning GIS four months ago on their own, and I'm gonna substitute, I've started learning a new skill on my own, because I think right now lots of people are taking the opportunity um, when they're not in a workplace to be able to explore some online learning. But the question these guys have is, how can I indicate that on my resume slash skills? You can put that on your, on your resume. So um, you can put, you know, basic understanding of whatever program it is or familiarity with whatever that skill is. Um, you can, if you've learned it on your own using particular like free courses, you can definitely list that. Um, I think that says something about the person too. It shows that they show initiative and that they're um, a self-starter and that they can pick up skills. Um, so I definitely would put that. I did recently notice um, within the last couple of days, LinkedIn actually has a skill testing quiz that you can do, like tests that you can do. And they have a bunch of, like they have Excel, they have Adobe, like they might even have GIS stuff, I'm not sure, but you could actually potentially take those types of quizzes and put that on your resume. Like I got 80% on the LinkedIn blank quiz. So um, definitely showcase those things. How will the topic of landscape design or horticultural jobs be discussed? Um, 
I think maybe they're asking like, is there, I'm going to make some assumptions here about this question. And if this person wants to repost their question um, in a different way, maybe where is the best place for, for someone who's looking for those types of jobs to search? Um, well, I'll do a plug for the Eco Canada job board. Uh, we do have a job board that is for, uh, you know, environmental specific jobs and they're usually very specialized sometimes. So things um, like that could be on there. Um, but then, you know, you could also be, if you know of company names or if you know of people that maybe have similar jobs, you could be searching them on LinkedIn and, and seeing who, um, they're connected to or you can sign up for job alerts that kind of thing is what I start to do I know that just to add into that um, a lot of green jobs are also posted on sites like work cabin work cabin um, as well as the PLT Canada job board <laughs> we all both have to plug um, and of course the bigger search engines like indeed are going to post a lot of the the big company jobs that are available um, this is possibly controversial. What is the difference between the wage subsidy program from PLT Canada and the one that Eco Canada is offering? Oh. I think that they're the same type of program. I think it's just two different funding sources and we're just two organizations doing similar things that we're available to, that, or that we have money available to offer to employers and to youth seeking jobs. Um, I think this area may go into a little bit more detail in the next webinar about some of the additional wage matching programs that exist. But they both will do the same thing. I think that there are just slight nuances with, with the different programs that are available on the websites. Um, what if your online present, presence is light, uh, but not much? What? If it is, is that the question? I think is it okay if you have an online present, but it's just not very strong. It's just a weak online presence. I think it's probably fine, but it depends on what you're doing. If you're just, um, if you're, if you've got a job and you're happy, that's probably fine. But if you're looking for a job, you're going to, you're going to, especially now when we can't get out to networking events in person, you're going to want to be on things like LinkedIn. Um, and even like, you don't have to create your own content. You don't have to write a blog about anything, but you should be following, um, you know, companies or leaders in the area that you want to get into or grow into and comment. So comment on an article is just say like, yeah, that was a great article really enjoyed reading that just things like that is going to make you show up and I have an example and I won't name names but there's a, a young lady on my LinkedIn who um, is a recent graduate and she's really putting herself out there and just seeing her name all the time um, like I'll know her when I see her at a conference next right so um, I think it is really important if you are looking for a job or if you're looking to um, maybe have a career change or um, promotion that kind of thing. Okay, so we have about five minutes left. Um, we likely will have to follow up on some of these questions after the webinar, um, but we'll try to get through as many as we can. Do you have any suggestions for how to research or where to look for outdoor education-based jobs? I'm a teacher that recently graduated from Queen's University um, with a focus in outdoor experiential education. Would a LinkedIn profile support my job search in this type of a field? For sure. I think LinkedIn is getting used um, more widely now. So that would help um, for, for sure. Um, I think that's always a good idea. And then um, was there another part of that question, like where they should be looking? Yeah, I, I will suggest um, as a former teacher that Apply to Education does post some outdoor education jobs that are, are like directly connected to school boards. But otherwise, I think looking for the private organizations would just be the same as other environmental searches. So your work cabin, your good works is another good one for those style of jobs. Um, and indeed, um, but definitely check through apply to education if you're looking at a specific school board. If you are leaving a master's degree off your resume, how do you explain that one to two year gap on your resume? Um, if you, if you, I think in that particular case, I would include it because that would explain the gap. Um, or you could say, you know, 
um, if it's a recent gap, it depends when it is. Like it's, it's kind of circumstantial um, for what I would recommend. Like if you'd done it 10 years ago, but you have work experience that happened after that, then you might just leave out some of the work experience that was right before that time. Um, but I think if you were doing it and uh, your that's your most recent experience, then you you should be able to list that. And then if you felt that you were going to be overlooked because somebody might view you as overqualified, I would just make sure you would address that in your cover letter. Great. Um, say that I'm interested in a posting with some technical skills that I'm familiar with from previous schoolwork, but have not used since. Should I still apply or should I take some time to review the subjects before I apply? I think you should just always be prepared to answer any questions that somebody might ask you about them. So if you feel like you couldn't answer basic questions, um, then you probably should refresh it. So as long as you are comfortable in whatever setting you learn them in or, or use them, then you can definitely put them on there. But if, if it was, um, you know, one course and um, you didn't fully understand it, but you kind of used it, you might want to just say like basic understanding or, um, you know, just be careful with the language there. You don't want to say you're an expert, right? So, and then you don't want somebody to ask you about something that you then, um, can't answer and then it just looks like you've kind of fibbed on your on your resume. So you just want to be careful with those things. What's the best way to follow up after an application? Uh, you can follow up by email. So I, I always appreciate when somebody um, emails me because it's a way to then remind them to um, if they haven't looked at your resume, they're now going to. And if they looked at it and they didn't maybe uh, put you in the maybe pile or whatever it is that they use, they might rethink what they've done because they're like, oh, this person stands out. Um, so I think it's always a good idea to do that. And you can always, um, if you're not sure who to email, you can always call like the reception, like the main line of a company and just say, um, I'm looking at this particular job. Do you know who's who is hiring for that? And are you able to provide their um, email address to me. And I've also had people reach out on LinkedIn too. So they'll see that I'm the HR manager at Eco Canada. And so if they've applied for a job with us, they'll reach out to me and just kind of mention, you know, say something there. And, and I always will check just to make sure I've received it even. So it's always a good idea. Great. Um, what type of advice do you have for someone who's looking to pivot their career to more green environmental focus if they haven't had the chance for professional experience yet? Uh, I'm in communications PR and really looking to match my professional career with my personal values and ethics. I've been volunteering as a communications director with a small nonprofit that is green focused over the past few months, but any other tips or advice would be appreciated. Thanks in advance. Um, it sounds like you're doing all the right things because um, my recommendation would be to volunteer or to network um, and just start following the companies that you want to work for. They might not have an opportunity for you now, but they might down the road and, and just, um, I would really be using the networking opportunities um, in, in that particular case. Okay, great, thank you. Can, um, I'm just trying to find, I'm about to finish my PhD and would like to start my career in the industry. However, I find it very difficult to adapt my social media profile and resume to find a job. Any tips? Um, like you need help writing it? Is that kind of the question? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll get back to that one and we'll respond directly. Um, great tips. What if I know what type of role and company I want to work for in the future, but I don't have all the necessary skills or qualifications? Should I focus on researching what steps could take me there? Definitely. So if you're, if you've got a dream job and you can see what those dream jobs are requiring in terms of qualifications and skills, um, you should be definitely looking to, um, do those and to, to further yourself and things that you're more, um, passionate about are definitely going to come easier to you. So I would be researching, um, you know, courses or different um, groups, for instance, that you can network with and chat with. Um, yeah, I think just really doing your research into the type of role that you want and what's going to be required within that and then making sure that you're, you're checking off those boxes. The other thing I've heard from uh, my CEO recently is make sure you're using the jobs and your time that you are spending at work 
moving you in the right direction. It doesn't necessarily have to be a junior role, but if your dream job is going to require a lot of communication, what kind of a part-time job or, or a, a developmental job can you do now that will start to build that skill set? So try to utilize, if, you, if circumstances allow, to, to move yourself in the right direction, even if it's a bit of a pivot, um, along with all the things Sarah talked about. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, too, because, I mean, for me in HR, um, I consider it like a customer service role in a lot of ways. I'm dealing with clients that are uh, candidates or employees, and so my experience throughout university was working um, retail, and so those skills are definitely transferable to um, other jobs out there. So I, I definitely recommend everybody kind of reflect and see what they've been doing and where their experience has come from and where they can um, align that with where they want to go. This is an interesting question. Um, and then I think we're going to have to call it because we're a bit over time. It was mentioned earlier that most openings are in Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, and BC. Would you be able to talk about how out of prov province hirings are going, especially with the pandemic measures in place? Do you think companies are willing to hire new grads from outside the province where the work is located? Well, that is a great question. It. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Um, um, just to clarify, most of the environmental employment does exist within the four um, provinces as aligned to the population um, distribution, but um, the jobs are everywhere. But the one interesting th thing that's happened, or maybe COVID has forced this to happen, is that a lot more employers are now more willing to employ workers from various provinces, even if the work uh, location of work is different. And so, I don't know, I was just browsing through my LinkedIn and I saw someone that actually has a job in Alberta but relocated to BC recently and the job has been permanently moved to be more um, remote. And so, you know, there's going to be opportunities elsewhere. The question is really which jobs could accommodate that physical distancing or remote work and the opportunity then wouldn't be limited to necessarily where the work was traditionally located. Thanks so much, Claudine. Okay, I will um, go back to some of these questions after this webinar and I will send out the responses to all that have participated today. Uh, we really do appreciate all of your really insightful questions and we are really, really thankful to Sarah and Claudine to be here to, to present their expertise. Um, and if you have any further questions afterwards, please reach out to myself or to Maria. I'm gonna put our email addresses in the chat as they are not on this slide. Um, and, and really, thank you for all of you to, for participating today, and we really hope you did take some, some valuable lessons from this. Please join us next month uh, for our webinar on networking, and you can register at pltcanada.org. So thanks so much, and I hope everyone has a really great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We'll just hold on a minute longer just so everyone can copy down those email addresses if necessary. Nice to see you again, Fazan.